Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends so uh, we are going to take up another important issue uh, which is related to unit 2 of uh, the discussion on uh, rural society uh, that is theorizing peasantry i think uh, uh, within theorizing peasantry as we have uh, seen that uh, we had spoken about uh, the issues relating to uh, debating peasantry uh, we have also discussed about the agrarian capitalistic development and the theory of present economy. And uh, here we are dealing with uh, unit 7 that is economic aspect of peasantry. Economic aspect of peasantry is going to be uh, a unit which will talk about uh, the peasantry on the lines of economy. Although we have spoken about the issue of economy earlier also, but uh, this unit is specifically dealing with the economic aspect of the peasantry. And uh, here I think uh, our major concern is that we will try to uh, speak about the works of Karl Marx regarding uh, the peasantry as a class and also we are going to speak about uh, the contribution of uh, uh, Daniel Thorner uh, who had also spoken about uh, the economic history of uh, peasantry uh, in the various facets. See basically when we try to speak about uh, the economic aspect of peasantry, uh, we try to speak about uh, many important components and uh, I think uh, before this we had uh, uh, discussed that how people like uh, V.I. Lenin, uh, Kwiatkowski for their sake or maybe we try to speak about the contribution of uh, uh, Daniel Thorner and also uh, we have uh, Chenov's contribution. Uh, with regard to the theory of present uh, economic behavior. So, I think uh, we had uh, many ways in which uh, we can represent or we can speak about uh, the economic class of peasantry. But here I think uh, the concern is that how we can locate or we can have the economic referent of the peasantry. And for that sake as I shared earlier also that we are going to speak about uh, the contribution of Karl Marx and Daniel Thorner. And uh, both these works are been reflected in uh, Shenin's book that is on uh, the present and present society which I have referred earlier also and this is basically uh, uh, taken from the original work. So, I think uh, most of the things are a uh, bit uh, sensitive and also very uh, exhaustive count of uh, how we can locate the presentry with regard to the economic criteria. I think uh, that is where we have tried to see the things. So, uh, we will divide uh, this discussions into two uh, broader halves. Uh, first segment will be basically devoted towards the understanding of peasantry and uh, peasantry which has to be seen uh, in a uh, what you can say pattern which has been spoken about by Karl Marx. And uh, second component uh, we will be speaking about the contribution of Daniel Thorner. So, I think uh, both the works will give us a detailed account of how uh, both the scholars have tried to see peasantry in terms of an economic category and how uh, we can see the economic aspect of peasantry within that particular framework. So, I think uh, uh, to begin with uh, we will first try to focus upon uh, Karl Marx as we all know that uh, Karl Marx is uh, basically uh, famous for his contribution in the field of uh, uh, the analysis of class. He had spoken about uh, uh, class and class struggle and that is one of his famous theory which has been read by economist, political scientist, uh, sociologist for their sake, anthropologist and many other social scientists. And uh, Karl Marx uh, understanding of class is based on uh, the economic criteria. And that way I think uh, when we try to speak about Karl Marx understanding of class, uh, we will try to see that uh, to what extent 
the peasantry tries to qualify uh, the understanding of class in the Marxian framework. And I think uh, uh, this story of uh, Marx uh, in lines of class is a bit different because uh, it will try to focus upon uh, various aspect and uh, somewhere we will try to see that uh, how peasantry are been not clearly taken up by Marx in his own analysis and he was trying to uh, see it uh, with regard to a specific uh, uh, episode which took place long back in Europe and uh, then he is trying to see that how the French peasantry basically his concentration or his understanding was based on the French peasantry and he was basically trying to look into the French peasant and within that framework he was trying to speak about this particular contribution. So, Karl Marx uh, and his basic work is peasantry as a class and uh, Karl Marx he was uh, basically speaking about this work uh, from his discussion that has been taken from Karl Marx the class struggles in France in 1848 to 1850 that is uh, uh, one important contribution and also the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte that was another important contribution uh, which has been uh, uh, taken into consideration uh, in dealing with this work that is peasantry as a class. And uh, I think uh, uh, these things are reflected in Karl Marx and Frederick Engels selected works uh, which is a popular work in 1950s. So, basically we will try to see that uh, uh, this has been uh, taken into consideration from uh, these important works of Karl Marx. So, uh, to begin with how uh, peasantry was been seen as a class, uh, we have to see that how Marx tries to locate peasantry basically the French peasantry uh, in the domain of class that is going to be an important issue. So, I think uh, let us start with that. Uh, first thing uh, we have to have some background about that how uh, the French peasantry was been seen basically with regard to the changeover which was taking place in France. And I think uh, as you all know that uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte who was uh, basically seen as the real hero of uh, uh, the French society and how he was trying to uh, put peasantry in particular domain. So, I think uh, we have to have uh, this story uh, which will basically be revolving around the French society and also uh, it will give a wider picture about how the peasantry can be seen as a class. So, it is basically the starting point comes with the 10th December 1848. It was the day of the peasant insurrection. Uh, now, why uh, this uh, day has been seen as peasant insurrection? Because uh, we try to see that uh, it was the day when the peasantry start showing the revolutionary character and only from this day does the February of the French present dates. So, I think that is going to be an important issue, the symbol that express their entry into the revolutionary movement. So, I think uh, we have to see that how peasantry was been seen as a class and basically they were been seen in uh, representing the revolutionary character and that is going to be an important issue. And as I said that Napoleon was the only man who has exhaustively represented the interest or and the imagination of the peasant class uh, that was uh, newly created in 1789. So, Napoleon in 1789 was trying to speak about uh, the consideration of how peasantry wants to see their world and uh, in that way Napoleon was to the peasants not a person, but a program. With the banner, with the beat of drum and the blare of trumpet, they marched to the polling booth shouting that no more taxes, down with the rich, down with the republic long live the emperor, behind the emperor was the hidden, the peasants war. So, I think uh, uh, this is uh, the, the narration which speaks about that how the peasantry, they were trying to be uh, during the uh, voting time, 
they were trying to support the Napoleon Bonaparte's effort uh, for making him the emperor and uh, they were basically trying to support him uh, like anything because uh, for them uh, he was the real hero uh, who could just uh, bring the uh, glory of the peasantry. So, 10th December was coup d'etat of the peasant uh, which means uh, overthrowing the existing government. So, 10th December that way 10th December 1848 becomes a crucial issue. Uh, Bonaparte represents a class and the most numerous class of French society at that time was the small holding peasant. Uh, so, that is going to be an important issue because uh, peasantry was uh, an important uh, class uh, which was been represented and the other uh, dynasties apart from Napoleon who were basically trying to have a certain control over the dynasty were the bond bonds who were the dynasty of the big landed property and the Orlean were the dynasty of the money. So, Bonaparte are the dynasty of the peasants that is the mass of the French people. So, I think uh, the whole house the whole French society was been divided into these three uh, dynasties Bonbon, bon, Orleans and the Bonaparte dynasty and uh, uh, Bonaparte was basically representing the peasantry whereas the Bonbons and Orleans they were representing the dynasty of the elites. Uh, uh, further Marx has said that the small holding peasants forms a vast mass the members of which live in the similar condition but without entering into the manifold relations with one another. I think this is the definition of uh, uh, Karl Marx for understanding peasantry as a class and I think uh, once we are trying to uh, move further uh, we can be in a better position to know that how peasantry has been represented in terms of a class. Uh, he said that their mode of production isolates them from one another, another instead of bringing them into the mutual intercourse. I think that is going to be an important issue that uh, their own mode of production that is the agriculture uh, on land uh, that was basically uh, isolating them from one another. The isolation is increased by the France bad means of communication and by the poverty of the peasants. So, I think uh, in addition to uh, the so called mode of production the other important issue was the bad means of communication which has been there whereby the interaction between the peasantry was not taking place and also the poverty of peasantry was another important issue. Their field of production the small holding admits of the no division of labor in its cultivation no application of science and therefore no diversity of development that is what is been reflected uh, by Marx in terms of analyzing peasantry that uh, it did not have the, the, the critical division of labor uh, which is the representation of the true class and also uh, they had the small holdings and uh, apart from that there was lesser use of science and technology in terms of agriculture and also uh, they did not have a vision of development. So, under these uh, considerations no variety of talents no wealth of social relationships uh, were the important things each individual present family is almost self sufficient. It itself direct directly produces the major part of its consumption and thus acquires its means of life more through the exchange with the nature than in intercourse with the society. So, I think uh, the interaction is normally being seen uh, with the nature and lesser interaction is seen among the people among the peasantry themselves. And we try to see that uh, a peasantry is seen basically as a small holding peasantry a peasant and his family alongside them another small holding a peasant and his family another peasant and another family a few scores of these make up a village. So, the different categories of uh, the peasant family they the scores of that that is the dozens of that uh, they make up the village and few scores of village make up the department. Department is the, the specific uh, township uh, specific uh, uh, city life. 
So, the few scores of village make up the department that is to be seen in terms of uh, uh, the typical district. In this way, the great mass of the French nation is formed by the simple addition of the homologous magnitude much as the potatoes in the sack form a sack of potatoes. I think that is the common term which has been used by Karl Marx with regard to referring to the peasantry that they were basically seen as homologous magnitudes much as the potatoes in a sack form a sack of potatoes. In so far as million of families live under the economic condition of existence that separate their mode of life, their interest and their culture from those of the other classes and put them in the holistic uh, hostile opposition to the later. So, I think uh, the relationship between the peasantry and uh, the wider society was not very uh, ripe, it was not very fruitful, rather there is having certain amount of hostile opposition between the two categories and uh, this is how they form a class. So, their understanding about the formation of a class has to be seen in terms of how their economic condition of existence separate their mode of life uh, from the other classes and that is how we can represent the peasantry in terms of a class. They cannot represent themselves. Now, this is wa what the peasantry is. They cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. They, their representativeness must at the same time appear as their masters wanted, as an authority over them, as an unlimited governmental power that protects them against the other classes and sends them rain and sunshine from above. So, virtually the leadership of the peasantry is missing by themselves and uh, what is required is that uh, uh, they wanted to uh, see their leadership through somebody else and who is going to give the color to their uh, what you can say terms and conditions towards their uh, requirements. The political influence of the small holding peasants therefore find its final expression in the executive power subordinating the society to itself. So, we see what Marx has said about the peasantry is that they are basically into the subordinate position with regard to uh, somebody who is going to rule over them and that is where the peasantry was been seen. So, the historical traditions gave rise to the belief of the French peasants in the miracle that a man named Napoleon would bring all the glory back to them. So, this is where the hope of the uh, French peasantry has been there towards Napoleon that uh, how he is going to bring about a certain amount of uh, uh, what you can say glory to uh, the peasantry and that is where we try to see that uh, the understanding of the peasantry, the trust of the peasantry was on Napoleon. So, uh, they could not represent themselves, but their representation was been seen uh, coming through Napoleon and that becomes an important issue. So, in the rising after the uh, coup d'etat that is uh, the war against uh, the dynasty, a part of the French peasants protested arms in hands against their own vote of 10th December 1848, that is the day when the French peasant have to uh, overthrow the existing dynasty and they have to have the rule of themselves through the Napoleon. The economic development of the small holding property has radically changed. The relations of the peasant to the other classes of society has changed under the Napoleon. Uh, the fragmentation of the land in the countryside supplemented the free competition and the beginning of the big industry in the towns. So, I think uh, under the Napoleon regime, uh, the peasantry had these changes. The peasant class was the ubiquitous protest against the landed aristocracy which had uh, just been overthrown. But in the course of the 19th century, the feudal lords were replaced by the urban asserts. The feudal obligations that went with the land was replaced by the mortgage. Aristocrated land property was replaced by Borgia's capital. The small holding of the peasant is now uh, only the pretext that allows the capitalist to draw profits, interest and rent from the soil, while leaving it to the tillers of the soil himself 
to see how he can extract his wages. So, virtually we try to see that the small holding of the peasant is uh, the way in which uh, uh, the there is uh, the capitalistic uh, uh, attempts to draw the profits are there and uh, it is basically from the interest and the rent from the soil uh, which is going to be the only way in which the profit can be earned. So, virtually we try to see that uh, uh, this is basically seen as an important issue uh, besides the mortgage with the capital imposes on it the small holding is burdened by the taxes are the source of life for the bureaucracy, the army, the priest and the court in short for the whole apparatus of the executive power. So, virtually the taxes which has been generated from the peasantry was been used by the so called uh, executive power for their own benefits for their own luxuries and that way I think it was taxing for uh, basically the peasantry. And finally, it produces an unemployed surplus population for which there is no place either on the lands or in the towns and which accordingly reaches out for the state office as sort of respectable arms and provokes the creation of the state post. So, I think uh, the, the, the situation of peasantry uh, in the regime of uh, the authority in the uh, against the state power was seen to be uh, very uh, subjugated. And we try to see that uh, uh, this particular thing was seen uh, because of uh, peasantry's uh, uh, situation. And we try to speak about uh, these particular things. And uh, we say that the French nations, from the weight of traditions and to work out in the pure form the opposite between the state power and the society. With the progressive under undermining of the small holding property, the state structure erected upon it collapse. The centralization of the state that the modern society requires arises only in the ruins of the military bureaucratic governmental machinery which was forged in opposition to the feudalism. So, I think uh, that is where we try to see that feudalism was been replaced by the so called government machinery, but this government machinery also had a specific pattern of ruling and which was basically making the things more worse. And we try to see that uh, uh, this is how the condition of peasantry was been seen. Napoleon who was basically been seen as the hero of the peasantry and he was basically trying to uh, uh, overcome the circumstances which has been laid down by the peasantry and the peasantry which was been seen as sufferer in terms of paying heavy taxes uh, to the uh, government machinery. Uh, so, I think peasantry was not having certain amount of collectivization as Karl Marx has spoken about this particular issue that uh, peasantry uh, were just seen as uh, the sack of potatoes who were not coming together in the form of collectivity because their mode of production isolates their interaction. So, I think uh, these are certain things which makes the things uh, uh, more disturbed and that is where we have to see that uh, ultimately <coughs> it is the, the concern for uh, the peasantry uh, to show how they can be represented in the wider world. And uh, uh, we try to see that the French society uh, which has uh, the majority of uh, the peasantry. Now, this peasantry uh, which were in majority has been seen as been exploited by the, the minority in terms of the ruling class and the different dynasties uh, which has been there, uh, the dynasties of the rich, the Orleans, the dynasties of uh, the so called feudalistic uh, order. So, I think uh, these sort of dynasties were trying to uh, succumb to the pressures or they try to uh, just overthrow the peasantry's existence and to have more and more exploitation of the peasantry. And uh, Napoleon was basically been seen as uh, a hope uh, which could bring the glory of the peasantry back into the surface. So, this is how we try to see that uh, Karl Marx was trying to see that how the peasantry has to be represented. And uh, we also try to see that peasantry which was basically seen as uh, what you can say uh, representing the majority of uh, the French population uh, in terms of uh, the countryside. But on the contrary, we try to see that the dynasties were basically trying to uh, exploit and uh, 
uh, Karl Marx uh, who was uh, not clearly speaking about uh, the sort of class consciousness uh, within the peasantry uh, which is an essential characteristics of uh, peasantry of class uh, according to Karl Marx. So, he was not trying to speak about, so we try to see that uh, the peasantry was seen as having certain element of class in itself uh, in terms of people who are falling in the similar mode of production. So, to that extent I think uh, they form a class, but when it comes down to another important issue of certain amount of revolution that is class for itself. Uh, so, that class consciousness was missing with regard to the peasantry and ultimately we try to see that class for itself character uh, which was not visible with the peasantry and they wanted to show that visibility uh, through somebody else and uh, this somebody else was basically uh, the Napoleon for the case over here uh, which has been highlighted by Karl Marx. He was basically trying to speak about that how the peasantry was being seen as representing the, 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 the two character of uh, the uh, people of the masses in general of the French society. So, I think uh, uh, this is one segment uh, which tries to speak about uh, the peasantry as a class in terms of an uh, economic category uh, which was the topic of our discussion and as I said that uh, uh, the second half will be uh, devoted to another important contribution by Daniel Thorner and uh, Daniel Thorner that way I think uh, is again going to represent uh, uh, the economic history and the famous work of course is uh, peasant economy as a category in the economic history uh, that is the work and uh, this is also been uh, uh, taken from uh, <coughs> Theodore Shannon's contribution that is present in peasant society. So, virtually we try to see that uh, uh, both the works Karl Marx understanding about peasantry as a class and Daniel Thorner's peasant economy and category in the economic history, uh, they have been well documented in the uh, contribution of uh, Theodor Shannon on peasant and peasant societies. And uh, uh, since as I said that uh, <coughs> these are the original works, uh, so we have to have uh, the understanding more in terms of uh, uh, what exactly has been reflected in the work and that is where we have to see uh, the whole understanding. So, uh, coming down to Daniel Thorner, uh, Daniel Thorner as the, the title itself speaks about that peasant economy as a category in the economic history that how peasant economy has been reflected in the economic history of the world uh, which has been talked about by Daniel Thorner. And uh, for that purpose it is essential to define peasant economy as a system of production and to distinguish it from the other historical system such as slavery, capitalism and socialism. So, I think that is uh, the first important thing uh, that we have to take into consideration. Uh, then also uh, we have to have a tentative definition of present economy and then to illustrate by the different examples uh, across the world. So, this is what has been talked about uh, uh, as an important uh, assignment which has been taken up by Daniel Thorner. And uh, here uh, Daniel Thorner was dealing with the features of the whole economy of the sizable countries and the countries uh, which he was trying to speak about, he has basically taken into consideration the units uh, which act as the scale of kingdoms or empires. Uh, basically, he was referring to Japan, uh, Tsarist Russia, China and then he was trying to speak about the nation, nation like Mexico and the grand imperial position including India and Indonesia. So, virtually he was trying to speak about the various units in terms of empires which I shared uh, in terms of nations and also in terms of the imperial positions. So, I think these are the three uh, broader units from which he takes certain countries and tries to give a justification for the present economy in these countries. Now, uh, Daniel Thorner has also given five criteria for determining whether the total economy of a given country, nation or the large colonial area is to be taken as a present economy. So, I think uh, this is where I think the five criteria has to be taken into consideration. The first two criteria relates to the production and the working population. They are intended to help distinguish present economies 
from the industrialized economies whether capitalistic or the socialistic. In a peasant economy roughly half of the total population must be agricultural and more than half of the working population must be engaged in agriculture and this is how we try to see that uh, the economy of the nation has to be identified. In a word we are saying that to be termed peasant an economy must be primarily agricultural. I think that is going to be an important issue that we have to take into consideration and in a capitalistic or the socialistic society which has been industrialized there may remain thousands or even millions of peasant, but we would no longer apply the term peasant to such an economy uh, taken as a whole. Uh, we have the distinction which has been there uh, between the, uh, the place uh, which uh, with, uh, <coughs> with the region which we say is a peasant in the typical sense. Uh, the criteria definitely which will be followed is the production and the working population that is going to be an important issue as we have said in the first and the second criteria. The third criteria requires the existence of state power and the ruling hierarchy of a particular kind, one in which the kinship or the clan order has weakened sufficiently to give way to the territorial state. So, I think uh, uh, this is uh, the third criteria which we have to take into consideration that where the state power has come into existence and the kinship bonds and the other issues are going to be secondary. Uh, uh, we can have uh, the fourth criteria uh, which comes into the picture that is the rural urban separation. I think the four criteria uh, which speaks about that how the rural is going to be in relation with the urban settings and here we try to see that uh, for the present economies the presence of towns and the division of division or break between the towns and the countryside is simultaneously there and we have the political, economic, social and the cultural elements uh, which are going with the peasantry. In practice uh, the peasants are held to be lesser or subject order existing to be exploited by all concerned means uh, peasantry are going to be dominated by the urban in that sense that is the, the basic criteria which has been used. And then uh, we have uh, the fifth and the final criteria. Uh, the fifth criteria is the most fundamental that is the unit of production. The unit of production by that we mean our concept of present economy the typical and the most representative unit of production are the present family household. We define the present economy uh, present family household as a socio-economic unit which grows crop primarily by the physical efforts of the members of the family. So, this is how the peasant uh, has been defined that we define peasant uh, that is Thorner defines peasant family household as a socio-economic unit which grows crop primarily by the physical effort of the members of the family. The principal activity of the peasant household is the cultivation of their own land or the allotment the household may also engage in other activities for example, in handicrafts the family may work perhaps be forced to work outside the household from time to time. The household may include one or more slaves, domestic servants or hired hands, but the total contribution of these non-family members to the actual crop production will be much less than that of the family members. So, I think in terms of proportion if you try to see, so we try to see that uh, proportionately the uh, peasantry in terms of economy in the unit of production they have to contribute more even if the helping hands are there that may be there, but uh, that is not going to affect the character of peasantry. So, in a peasant economy half or more of all the crops will be produced by the peasant household relying mainly on their own family labor. So, the effort of the family labor is going to be important alongside of the peasant producers there may be there may exist the larger units the landlords or the, the home farm tilled by the labor extract from the peasants uh, the estates on which the peasants may be employed for part of the year the capitalist, the capitalist farm in which the bulk of the work is done by the 
free hired labor. So I think uh, these things may also exist parallelly, but it is not going to have influence upon the present economy. So I think uh, these are the criteria which are been taken up by Daniel Thorner. In a present economy, the first concern of the production unit is to grow food crops to feed themselves, but this cannot be their sole concern. By definition, uh, they live in a state and are linked with the urban areas. They must sustain the state, the towns, the local lords. Hence, in one way or another, they must hand over, surrender or sell to other parts of their food crops. So, I think uh, that speaks about the linkage of peasantry uh, with the wider world and uh, we should try to see that uh, uh, it should not be seen as a slip into the trap of imagining a pure type of peasant household, a uh, peasant household which is typical isolated, uh, which consumes practically everything it produces and practically nothing else as distinct from the impure type uh, which produces for the market as well as for its own immediate needs. So, the latter is historically more common and more characteristics. In point of fact, the household unit in the peasant economies frequently dramatize their dual focus by growing two crops. The first is the cereal essential to their own subsistence and that of society as a whole. And the second is much more like, likely to be the non-food grain. Uh, it may be a fruit, a fiber or an oil seed which is produced precisely with an eye to barter, sale or exchange of some sort uh, to the marketplace or to the urban setting. So, we try to say that uh, the subsistence as well as their relationship with the wider world, both the things have to uh, happen simultaneously and that is how we can see that uh, the market oriented and substance oriented crops are to be grown uh, by the peasantry. Uh, to be brief, we have defined peasant economies in terms of the predominance of agriculture both in working population. We have required the existence of territorial state. We have indicated the characteristics unit of production uh, which must be seen in terms of uh, uh, the peasant family household with a double orientation that is for themselves and for others. And also uh, we have to see that we must emphasize that no simple, uh, uh, no single one of these element will suffice to determine whether or not a given economy is indeed a peasant economy. So, uh, somewhere we try to see that all these features must be found together and must relate to the economy of a whole country. And that is where we have to see that uh, these five criteria which has been identified by Daniel Thorner are important for understanding the present economy uh, with regard to uh, uh, what say the, the word economy. And we have to see that if all these five criteria are been fulfilled, then only we can say that this category can be represented as the present economy vis-a-vis -vis the nation state. Now, uh, as we have shared earlier uh, that uh, Daniel Thorner has uh, given the example of Tsarist Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, India, Japan and China. Uh, so, let us deal uh, one by one uh, with these categories. Uh, we try to see uh, firstly he was trying to take into consideration the Tsarist Russia. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, in the present economies of Tsarist Russia of the 19th century, uh, they have the richest history and uh, the Russian scholars carried the analysis of the present economies further than anybody else. So, that way I think uh, peasantry are being duly represented in the uh, Russian literature. In the century and half before 1917, the imperial structure of Tsarist Russia was expanding out uh, into Siberia and uh, that is where we try to see in terms of the present economy, the most distinctive feature of the countryside is uh, in the later Tsarist era was the close interdependence of landlord estate, land and rights and small peasant holdings together. Uh, in centuries before the emancipation of the serfs in 1861, the bondage of peasantry guaranteed the landlord the labor supply 
needed for their estates. So, I think uh, there is a, a relationship which is there between the peasantry and the estate that the peasant uh, household were basically acting as uh, the providers for the labor supply uh, to the estate uh, people in that sense as such. And we try to see that the size and the importance of the old landlord estate was much reduced uh, through time. Uh, by the late 19th century, individual present tenures were gradually increasing its importance. And this has happened basically uh, 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 after the uh, various uh, changes which, which took place across the world, especially uh, the world war situations. In the decade after the revolution of 1917, Russia ceased to be a peasant economy, emerging instead under socialism as both urbanized and industrialized. So, virtually we try to see the Russia which was having a long history in terms of the peasantry, especially in the estate system uh, which has been there under the Tsar's rule. But uh, with the advent of uh, uh, the modernity, the significance of the growth of capitalism in the city and the country, we try to see that Russia has ceased to have the peasant economy in terms of uh, the five criteria which has been referred earlier. And uh, we try to see that uh, uh, Russia cannot be depicted as uh, a nation uh, which can represent the present economy uh, according to Daniel Thorner. Uh, the second country which he is speaking about is Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia uh, under the Dutch rule constituted one of the oldest and the most striking colonial rule in both of its major forms direct or indirect. And we try to see the peasants were compelled under the so called cultural system to grow certain crops which the Dutch wanted to export. Uh, this is basically a condition in which we try to see that uh, they were basically involved uh, in development of the large plantation for the growth of export crops for which for their labor supply for these plantation the Dutch drew on the peasants from the bordering villages. They emerged particularly in the <coughs> Java at the Sumatra uh, a pattern of large plantation, the village communities with the group rights in lands and small peasants among them among whom in the course of time the sentiment of the individual family holding uh, depend. So, I think uh, this is where we try to see the change has taken place. Uh, the missing element uh, uh, within the Indonesia was the indigenous capitalism, indigenous capitalism uh, which is a colonial uh, in a colonial setting was practically negligible both in the city and in the countryside. Uh, as of 1949 when the Dutch had stopped the control, Indonesia has very little modern industry and a quite limited urban population uh, barely enough in fact to qualify under our criteria as a present economy. So, we try to see that uh, even Indonesia does not represent the characteristics of present economy uh, as per the criteria of uh, what uh, uh, Daniel Thorner was speaking about. And then we have next the case of Mexico. Uh, Mexico uh, it is basically having the similarities between the present economies of Java and Mexico uh, which is quite uh, uh, visible. And uh, in Mexico during the century after the end of the Spanish rule in 1823 uh, there was a pattern of large estates uh, which were locally called as the Hacendas, the unfree labor supply which is called as the peonage in the local setting and also the weakening uh, village community uh, rights in the lands and a very slow growth of individual family uh, holdings. I think these are the characteristics uh, uh, which has been there uh, basically with regard to uh, the Mexican situation and uh, we try to find out that uh, in Mexico <coughs> if we try to see uh, the industry has expanded rapidly in certain parts of the country. Uh, and, uh, uh, it is because of the large part of substantial foreign investment which took place and hundreds of thousands of peasants have left their villages to find work in the rapidly growing cities uh, because of the fast urbanization. And in the uh, decades, uh, recent decades well <coughs> more than half of the national product has been the non-agricultural 
and now the half of the country's population is urban. So, Mexico has left her phase of present economy uh, according to uh, Daniel Thorner and uh, it also does not represent the true character of the present economy uh, as per the criteria which has been raised by uh, Daniel Thorner. And then he was trying to speak about the contribution which has been reflected uh, in terms of peasantry in India. And uh, <coughs> regarding India, he was trying to speak about that uh, uh, India which was basically everywhere was the peasantry, peasant families and uh, uh, they were basically the cultivators of the small amount of lands. Uh, caste and untouchabilities are the distinctive characteristics of India and one of the principal economic function of caste is the countryside has been to emphasize the inferiority of the lower caste who have for ages served their superiors as the <coughs> cheap dependent agricultural labor. Uh, during the, <coughs> the regime of the British development in India, uh, half dozens of the largest railway systems in the world has been introduced and along with this appeared many other elements of what the economics jargon called as the infrastructure of development. Since India attained independence in 1947, the government has thrown its weight behind the rapid development of the comprehensive range of heavy industries. In the 1950s, the agriculture, agriculture principally carried out on by the small peasant families still accounted for the roughly half of the total national product. India is today still a present economy. So, I think uh, if you try to see in the Daniel Thorner's understanding, uh, India is marked by the typical <coughs> present economy uh, according to Daniel Thorner. Talking about uh, another important uh, uh, nation that is Japan, uh, here uh, with regard to Japan, uh, Daniel Thorner says that less than 50 years after the <coughs> Meiji restoration of 1868, Japan has ceased to be the present economy. And we try to see that uh, uh, vast literature assessing the uh, abrupt and dramatic revolutions uh, which took place uh, in Japan and we try to find out that after the Meiji restoration of 1868, the present proprietors were freed from their feudal obligations and confirmed in the ownership of the land they cultivated. And because of these reforms, the old <coughs> rice levies were supplemented by the fixed annual tax in money payable to the state. And we try to see that uh, uh, this ad, uh, situation was advantage for the rich peasants who sometimes acted as the rich brokers. And that is how we try to see that uh, there was certain amount of progression which has happened with regard to the understanding of the peasantry in Japan. Uh, <coughs> the average uh, for tenants, the Meiji reforms brought no benefits. Uh, they still had to pay rents in kinds and at the rate of about half of an average crop, the rise in the price of rice did not help them since they marked so little. So, in the early 1880s, about one third of the arable land was worked ag under the tenancy. By the time of the first world war, the fraction has increased to nearly one half. So, we try to see that the average area worked by Japanese peasant uh, was about one hectare around 1868 and remained for the most household roughly in the same right up to 1918. So, we try to see that uh, this is the story of uh, Japan where we have uh, the Meiji restoration uh, reforms have took place. Uh, we try to see that the proportion of the population living in the villages usually defined for Japan as place not less than uh, uh, significant population of um, 87 percent. In terms of our first criteria of present economy, contribution of agriculture to total national production, uh, Japan by the eve of the first world war had unmistakably stopped being a present economy. So, we try to see that even Japan did not reflect the element of uh, the peasantry uh, which has been talked about by Daniel Thorner. And then we try to speak about another important nation uh, that is trying to speak about China. And uh, as in India and Japan, 
The agriculture of China for several centuries before 1950 has been uh, seen as a petite culture and we try to see that uh, in China uh, the present handicrafts uh, which has been traditionally uh, offered supplementary employment uh, weekend before the com uh, competition of machine made goods from Japan and the West. The development of modern cities uh, was very limited and entirely inadequate for draining of the population from the countryside and uh, we try to see that uh, uh, the China was having uh, paying the heavy rents on their uh, tiny holdings uh, in terms of tax collection and the Chinese peasants were tenants or petty owners come tenants and the amount of rent they used to pay that was very heavy. So, the difficulties of the peasantries were compounded by multiple extractions from landlords, warlords, usurers and petty government officials. They suffered further in the course of wars, invasions, famines, civil war and the revolution. So, in the years since 1950, the Peking regime has exerted the tremendous effort to transform this present economy. Uh, in the cities, there has been the immense development of modern industries. In the countryside, the vast program of land reforms begin by taking away the properties of the landlords and distributing it the lands in the small uh, bits to the peasants. So, these attempts have been made apart from that the village cooperatives, uh, collective farmings and the establishment of the large rural communes had also taken place. Uh, whether the agriculture contribution half or more of the total national product has been there or not, I think that is going to be an important question. And it is hard to say with any assurance whether or not China is still a peasantry economy. So, I think uh, uh, somewhere we try to see that transformations which took place in the countryside and also in the urban areas the things which had uh, uh, taken place uh, by the uh, Peking regime in 1950s uh, certain modifications have been there uh, with regard to uh, China. But still we try to see that uh, 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 whether the present economy can be retained in China or not that is going to be an important question. So, uh, from these six examples uh, which has been taken by Daniel Thorner of the present economy. Uh, which has been drawn from the modern world, uh, we have been explicitly seeing the various criteria, and uh, we have to see that to what extent uh, in all these nations uh, we try to see that the five criteria which had been identified by Daniel Thorner has to be seen. And we try to find out that uh, he was trying to see uh, things on these lines. Uh, first thing of course is the indigenous or the colonial rule that which has seen which he tried to see across uh, all the nations. Then the small scale cultivators only uh, uh, which has to be given more importance or prominence that is another important issue. Uh, we also have to see the individual family holdings of land only that is going to be another important issue. Then also we have to speak about the hierarchy of peasantry at the village level uh, that is another important issue which uh, one has to really see. And finally, we have to speak about the urbanization and industrialization as a factor in reducing the relative importance of the peasantry in the economic uh, in the economy uh, taken as a whole. So, I think uh, these are the things uh, uh, which has been focused upon by Daniel Thorner. We might say that we have sketched uh, the cases of countries uh, uh, in this particular framework and we try to see that. Uh, how the present economy has to be seen uh, under these uh, 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 parameters uh, across the world and how we can represent the present economy. So, it may be of interest to situate present economy as we have defined uh, uh, as uh, Daniel Thorner has defined in relation to Karl Marx well known mode of production. Our present economy includes societies falling under the Marx uh, feudal mode of production and his Asiatic societies. So, I think uh, somewhere peasantry can be located in these two category in the Marxian framework. We also have to see that uh, the time has arrived to treat European experience in categories derived from the world history. So, I think uh, we should not see the European model as the universal model uh, which is going to be appealing for everybody. Rather, we have to see that to what extent uh, we may be in a better position to skew the world history into the western European countries. 
so uh, we have to see that the European experience in category derived from the word history and it should not be that uh, the word history has to be uh, shrinked into the western European categories. I think uh, this is where we have to actually uh, see uh, that uh, somewhere we have to locate that how the peasantry has to be visualized and how the peasantry can be seen as an important categories uh, in terms of uh, uh, the economic history. And uh, <coughs> as we said earlier that uh, Daniel Thorner has uh, extensively uh, seen uh, the various uh, uh, countries and uh, on based on uh, the five criteria which he identified either it has to be seen in terms of uh, uh, the question of uh, what one can say uh, speaking about uh, the basic issue uh, of uh, production and the working population and also on the criteria of state power and the ruling hierarchy uh, and also uh, the criteria of the rural urban separation uh, that is going to be important and finally uh, the issue with regard to the uh, unit of production. I think on these uh, broader parameters which Daniel Thornton tried to speak about, uh, he was trying to justify that how the uh, present economy as a category in the economic history can be located. So, I think uh, this is where we have to actually see that how the things have to be worked down, but important is that uh, either we have spoken about uh, <coughs> in the first section about Karl Marx, how peasantry was been seen with regard to the uh, French Revolution, especially uh, the advent of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, and how peasantry tried to contribute effectively uh, towards the maintenance of uh, the new dynasty uh, <coughs> that is going to be an important issue. So, what is required in that sense is that uh, they have to basically see uh, things uh, differently. So, peasantry as a typical class in the true Marxian sense uh, cannot be located uh, in the, the explanation which has been given by Karl Marx with regard to the peasantry and uh, they are to be seen as a, a sack of potatoes which has been emphasized by uh, Karl Marx. Uh, on the issue of uh, Daniel Thorner's uh, understanding uh, in terms of a typical uh, economy, we try to see that uh, uh, the economic aspect of the peasantry which has been talked by Daniel Thorner, especially uh, how he is trying to uh, link up uh, the various issues. Uh, we try to find out that uh, Daniel Thorner on the basis of his classification could find that only in few places uh, uh, like in India uh, he could locate that uh, peasantry is going to be visible and to some extent uh, it was been uh, visible basically in <coughs> Japan. But uh, more or less if you try to see that peasantry in the true sense uh, has to be seen on various parameters and that is going to be an important issue when we try to speak about uh, the contribution of both the scholars. I think uh, <coughs> uh, we have talked in detail about uh, the economic history of the peasantry, how uh, the, in the economic framework we can locate the peasantry in terms of uh, uh, the economic history or in terms of uh, how peasantry can be seen uh, on an economic parameter. Uh, that is the discussion that we had in this particular uh, <coughs> outline of uh, discussion that we had. But important is that uh, how much or to what extent we are going to make uh, ourselves conversant with these works so that we can have a real picture about uh, uh, the understanding of peasantry in terms of the economic reference. So, friends, I think uh, the further discussions will make the things more clear. I think uh, <coughs> uh, we have talked in detail about uh, the economic history of the peasantry, how uh, the 